Thank you very much, Mark, um, and a pleasure uh, to be here. Actually, a pleasure to be to be in this room. Um, you know, like any great British institution, the architecture was designed with hierarchy uh, very much in mind. So I will enjoy looking down on you all um, for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. Um, but it is a pleasure to be here. I, I, I will note, actually, uh, that I have uh, five minutes less than uh, I was originally given. And as anybody who's, who's uh, been unfortunate enough to see me speak before, I really have never seen a microphone that I don't like. Um, so I will, I will try and keep to time. I have to admit, though, that uh, I did think about not coming here. Um, in fact, not being in the US or the UK at all at the moment, giving everything that's going on and stopping in Iceland on the way over um, and staying there. But in all seriousness, um, with U.S. actions on immigration, with Brexit, there is temptation for us as an industry, for us as individuals, as organizations, to keep our heads down, uh, to keep working in our bubble, to stay calm and carry on. But my message is that we simply can't afford to do so. This is not a time for us to retreat as an industry, uh, as scientists, researchers, librarians, publishers, it's the time for outreach, for collaboration, for partnership, and it's a time to be bold. Uh, and as an industry, we should continue to be bold. Allow me to read something. Three years into his presidency, Thomas Jefferson said, no experiment can be more interesting than that we are now trying, and which we trust will end in establishing the fact that man may be governed by reason and truth. Our first objective should therefore be to leave open to him all the avenues to truth. Truth, knowledge. Isn't that why the first journal, Philosophical Transactions, was founded? Isn't that what enlightenment is about? The spread of knowledge, the spread of progress, the fundamental values that underpin it, and those which we all transact and undertake every day. And I will say again and again, we have a commitment to reaffirm what it means to be part of this industry, to reaffirm what it means to be in support of science, scientists, researchers, and the work that they do every day. These were the values that motivated Charles Wiley to open his printing shop in Manhattan, Lower Manhattan in 1807, a shop that would soon become a meeting place for poets, for philosophers, to discuss and debate issues of the day. This was before sport, so I imagine they actually talked about politics and cultures and culture. And I know that for publishers, and certainly for Wiley, this is our 210th year as a company, that it's easy to invoke our past and that somehow gives us legitimacy and authority. And that has sometimes has not done us any favors, especially in a digital world. But I ask, and I ask us all to keep considering, in what ways are we still relevant? What values do we represent and embody as an industry? So the political climate is a bit of a wake-up call about protecting some of our most fundamental values. And it should be the same for us as an industry. We must focus on the value and actions which underpin the role we play, putting truth and science, global science, and the researcher, regardless of where she comes from, at the center of everything that we do. Like the things that drive science, debate, skepticism, rationality, intellectual liberalism, diversity, collaboration. I'll just say it, I worry deeply that these things are under threat and I believe we have a role to play as an industry, whatever we believe politically. But don't take my word for it. Let me quote an even more famous thinker, Kent. Anderson, where are you? <laughs> Why would the suggestion that Kent's a famous thinker provoke anybody to laugh? Uh, so, show of hands, who read Kent's post from a few weeks ago in Scholarly Kitchen, scientific publishing in a time of political assaults? Good for you. He nails it. In a time of political upheaval that threatens even the fundamental acceptance of how facts are established and how accuracy is achieved, what is our role? Kent references a great quote from the nuclear physicist, former White House science advisor, uh, 
uh, John Gibbons, and I'm actually going to read it quickly. There are those of us who believe that publishers should stay out of politics. This is not a luxury we have. In truth, it is not a luxury. We have, it's a luxury we have never had. Each of us needs to be a partisan for science, to embrace a partisanship born of hope for the future. It is not partisanship based on party ideology, but concern over the possibility that the work of generations that has put us at the forefront of world science and technology could be undone. It is a personal partisanship based on conviction, and such partisanship is the moral calling of every citizen in a democracy. So what can we do? And what are we as an industry going to do? How are we going to become advocates for truth, for evidence, for global science, for the interests of researchers? And we are acting. There are some great examples right now. ProQuest has launched a displaced researchers program to provide no-cost access to its databases for students um, who are prevented from, from uh, going back to their universities because of travel brands or, or immigration changes. Uh, the Times Higher Ed, uh, just over a week ago, Elsevier, provided some powerful analysis from Saibel and Scopus about the importance of Iran and Iraq to scientific endeavor. And at Wiley, we're hosting conversations on our exchanges blog, trying to raise the volume about the importance of protecting global interconnectedness. It's a good start, but we need to continue, I say whatever our politics, to think about the role that we play. I believe we have a responsibility and an obligation to engage widely and vocally in support of science and scientists. But what do we do as content and technology companies to enable researchers to do great work, to ensure that researchers are connected to each other, to ensure that research is being disseminated widely, to ensure that it's being accessed? Research practice is changing with each new generation of researchers, with each changing demographic, right? This is a digital generation of researchers. If the researcher is our center of gravity, and there's an industry, the supply chain that Mark's talking about, at the center of that is the researcher. That's why we exist. So leave it to, uh, to Jeff Bezos to get to the point. Put this another way. In an interview with Fast Company, which just put Amazon back on the top of its most innovative companies list, he said, by using the divine discontent of the customer as a North Star, we are energizing a culture of relentless progress. And Jeff Bezos is a guy who travels the world with a small camera. And whenever he sees innovation he thinks can be improved upon by Amazon, he takes a photograph of it, and he immediately sends it back to Seattle. He said, see this, we can, we can do better. I would say we're not really harnessing technology the way that we could do on behalf of researchers to do three important things to support them. To build networks between and across disciplines, geographies, and industries. To more easily share discoveries with peers of the public and to ensure seamless access to all content across publishers to allow researchers to do their work. Perhaps we as an industry need to listen to Jeff Bezos and Silicon Valley more. We need to experiment more, fail more, uh, and do more. Ultimately, though, I think it's about achieving connectedness. If you've never read it, there's a book called The Content Trap by Bharat Anand from Harvard Business School. And his basic thesis is that we won't survive, we as a media industry, won't survive just by creating content, by putting it inside the bottle, by owning and protecting it and controlling its distribution. We will only be successful if we can connect the users of those, that content to each other in the ways that they want to be connected. So how do we do this? So we should continue, firstly, to re-engineer the workflows, right? the way that we as an industry go from researcher to reader. Digital first, seamless, frictionless, creating greater speed, greater efficiency and effectiveness. And we should be making sure that that research that we bring to market far more quickly than we do now, that we're offering access to all those who want it, making the experience as frictionless and easy as possible, and taking into account the different economic circumstances of people and countries around the world, particularly in developing economies. So there's no greater tool, obviously, to connect, and this is about connections, than the internet. And here, as you probably know, is Tim Berners-Lee father of the internet. So publishers, we are actually quite good at patting ourselves on the back. 
How often have all of you, I know I have, well, we've been online since 1991. 97% of our business is now digital. But what's really changed about the way that we operate as an industry and the way that we deliver and distribute content? How much has really changed? So I would say that scholarly publishing really has not yet taken full advantage of the web. And at the heart of it is a production process that's still based on the basic unit of currency that it has been for years, which is the page. Journals set page budgets, authors pay page charges, and vendors are paid by the page. We have formats that are scattered between authoring and reading formats, essentially between HTML and PDF, and these formats are designed to push all of it through a long, matured, print-driven production workflow that we've been using for years. And HTML is kind of used, treated as a second-class output, tolerated as a necessary layer for enabling search engines to do their indexing at a quality level that only really guarantees that users can use it to get to the PDF. But HTML should be a first-class citizen in the production workflow. The advantage of HTML, obviously, is its immediate ability to be processed by a rich ecosystem of tools, the primary of which is obviously the web browser. But a single workflow, a single HTML workflow that connects the researcher to the reader would lead directly to lower cost, to lower complexity, higher expressiveness of content. And it does demand a total commitment to open source and open standards by publishers. And why is that important? So an open source solution to convert researcher outputs into open, structured web content would have a transformational impact on the marginal cost, efficiency, effectiveness of scholarly communication. If Uber is a 10x transformation in public transport, then open standards and open source would be a 10x transformation in publishing. Pretty obviously, unleashing the web allows us to do things that we're still not really doing as well as we should. So the integration of data, the integration of multimedia, making sure content is accessible on and across devices, uh, enrichment that improves article results that enables better curation, and a one content workflow from HTML to PDF, in a single, which would result in a single version of record each time. And better results for scientists better, more informative Google search results, better support for data and text mining. This is a big part of our strategy at Wiley, as I'm sure it is everywhere, in terms of developing our journal workflow, developing our author services. It's a big reason why we acquired Atipon at the, uh, at the back end of last year, to accelerate this process for all of our partners, libraries, for society partners, and for our fellow publishers. And we're excited about what this means, that Scholarly publishing needs to start to operate on something closer to internet time. Publishers need to be good at cloud sharing, at real-time data analysis, at open discovery, even if the final product is not the article or even the final database. Not to say that edit editorial curation is not as important as ever. It is with an explosion of content we continue to need to be, uh, to own the filtering, the quality control and the process that ensures that it's... Uh, it's of, it's of quality. It's our job to protect evidence-based science and to be clear that it has the evidence that it requires. But we do need to do this at a considerably faster pace. And by embracing the web in a way that we are, but we can do more, embracing open standards and open source, we can begin to accelerate that. And this is really about my point one, which is in order to protect the values of science, we need to enable researchers to do what they want to do, enabling them to publish faster and to be that are connected to each other. But, in parallel, we need to also address the question of access. So some of you may have seen this before, but two simple observations. First, visits to the ResearchGate platform are greater than on any single publisher site. Now, you might say that this is driving usage of non-final versions of articles. You may say, that many of, the, many of the articles are on ResearchGate in violation of copyright. But that's not the point. Or, actually, it is the point. Our customers don't really care if it's the version of record, and they're not too bothered about our arcane 
copyright rules. Secondly, Sci-Hub is unambiguously a pirate site, but it's a major presence in scholarly communications, whether we like it or not. And I would argue that the usage, particularly of ResearchGate, actually and Sci-Hub, is driven by ease of access, which then drives research profile and discovery. One click, you have access to content from across, across publishers. That ease of access to everything is what we expect of most of our digital experiences. Think about buying on Amazon, watching on Netflix, listening on Spotify, right? You expect to have access to everything you need, when you need it, wherever you are. And you expect whoever you're consuming that content from to pretty quickly know who you are, what you like, what you prefer, where you want to be, and to be able to help you find the things that you need. But Sci-Hub, yes, is mostly driven by lack of access to content uh, geographically, parts of the world where either you can't afford it or it's blocked or whatever it might be. And the usage patterns around the world certainly would confirm this. But an article in Science about six months ago showed that quite a few researchers around the world uh, who have legal access to content already use Sci-Hub because it's easier to navigate, because you have 50 million articles in one place and one simple user interface. The main point is that in a digital environment, those who don't have access will quickly find a way to get it. Steve Jobs said, you'll never stop piracy. So what you can do is compete with it. So route one, we can make our own offerings better, more convenient, more timely, all of these things, right? That's how Netflix competed with BitTorrent. Netflix is a much better experience than trying to download from a pirate BitTorrent site, that's for sure. And you have seamless access across devices, it always knows where you are, it knows who you are, it recommends things, that's winning, right? That's winning. Alternatively, we can take the legal road. We can make these sites harder to access. We can shut them down. We can issue takedown notices. We can work with the courts, with governments. That has its limitations. Do I think we should give up protecting copyright from piracy and other forms of infringement? Absolutely not. But we do have to recognize that there are limits to that approach. And if we're going to thrive as an industry, we have to do much more to enable access access across publisher sites, access across content, access from anywhere in the world. And in fact, colleagues in the industry are already addressing this. So through a project which I'm sure many of you know, RA21, under the sponsorship of the STM Association, the starting point being that the 20-year-old technology of IP authentication just isn't adequate anymore. Two reasons, right? One, it's just too easy to still steal stuff using compromised credentials. And secondly, it might work fine on campus, but it sure doesn't work in Starbucks or on the road or the train or at home. And the RA21 project has established some, some draft principles here, which, which uh, I'm sure some of you, have, not all of you, have seen. But I do think this is, this is worthwhile, and Wiley's certainly proud to take a leadership role in this. And if you're not engaging with it, I certainly urge you to do so, go to the STM website, um, speak to Ivka Schmidt from STM. And there are other moves afoot. Um, you may be also aware that publishers are beginning to talk about how we can enable sharing. Going back to what do researchers want to do, how do they want to work, how do they want to behave, why are they a research gate? It's because they want to share. So a project which currently goes under the name very early stage of cross-share Right, which starts from the point of view the sharing of articles between researchers will always happen, how can we better enable it? Right, scholarly collaboration networks are eroding publishers' positions, so do we stop them, or do we enable it to happen as seamlessly, effectively, and as productively as we can? To do that, we're going to have to work together as an industry, quite clearly, uh, but at the heart of it is the researcher. And how can we enable them to do what researchers clearly want to do? So let's go back to our center of gravity. The researcher as a reader, a scientist, and an author. So authors are increasingly expecting a scientific publishing experience that resembles their experiences with other forms of digital media. Posting, blogging, 
What, they, what we hear from authors all the time is that they struggle with the time and the quality of peer review. They want a faster publication process and better, more immediate impact. And we should harness technology, particularly around our workflows, to address it. And readers' expectations are evolving at the same time. They want seamless access to research information. An individual researcher accesses research content over 300 times a year. They want a more efficient reading experience. They want seamless access across platforms. We need to think about, are there alternatives to versions of record that would make this happen more easily? Um, some of the funder interest that's growing in, in preprints, as you know, uh, towards a global community-driven server of biomedicine, uh, ASEP Bio. How can we as publishers interop interoperate with those to help provide added value services? This is about technology, harnessing technology not only to deliver content, those things that we've done for years, but actually to do more than that, to connect and enable science to happen by enabling people, researchers, to connect with each other and enabling much, much broader, more seamless, frictionless access across platforms so that researchers can do the work they need to do. I say it again, they are the center of gravity. If we can help more researchers spend more of their time researching and less of their time trying to find their way through an arcane publishing process, you know, every time you resubmit a journal article, even to the same publisher, you have to go through the whole process again. Right? Why is it so complex and why haven't we really harnessed technology to make a big difference? This is about global interconnectedness and independent science, which takes me all the way back to the beginning and why I thought about stopping in Iceland and staying there, is that we need to embrace the values of our customers, by which I mean researchers, librarians, everybody connected in that value chain. And we need to embrace their values by developing our business to become more open, more collaborative, more disinterested, and more experimental. Thank you. So I think we have Timekeeper. Questions, how long do we have? Ten minutes, there you are. So any questions or comments, indeed? Is that Anthony? I can only just see. It is. Anthony Watkins, Cyber Research. Um, some of us were the uh, academic publishing in Europe meeting, and we heard an impassioned, can you hear me all right? It's yes. Impassioned um, uh, keynote by the editor of The Lancet, which was actually difficult to interpret, but my interpretation was we should help our authors reach out to the public and the policy makers. Now, do you think we should be doing it as publishers? And are we putting money into it? Um, so the, the answer to this, no, I'll take them in order. Should we be doing that? So if I, if I understand you right, Anthony, should we as publishers be enabling our authors, so the, the research community, to access public policy and the, to have a voice, essentially beyond the voice of, of um, science itself? The other, I, yes, I do think. I, I, I certainly think we have a role to play in that. Um, you know, the, the, the public understanding of science, you know, something that I've been interested in for a long, long time, um, having been involved at the university in Durham and one of the first chairs of the public understanding of science um, over, over 25 years ago. And I think clearly that some of the things I talked about, I'm not going to go just stay on my hobby horse, but some of the things that I talked about at the beginning that worry me um, and I didn't talk about the fact that I worry that facts are no longer facts. You know, I worry that evidence is no longer evidence. You know, I worry that public debate has moved away from let's have an intelligent discussion around, I can certainly, I understand your opinion, it's different from mine, but the facts are the facts. Um, and I do think that, that we as an industry uh, and, and science and um, have a lot to say to the public and a lot to say more widely about how important it is to protect those values um, and those really are values around the principles of academic endeavor. Are we doing enough collectively? We're not really funding that, I don't think, or even have 
uh, a collective approach to that. I think individual publishers um, would do some work around that. I mean, certainly, you know, we have some work we're doing now uh, at Wiley to create a series mainly of, of on online seminars and webinars around science, scientific practice uh, and knowledge. I think it's going to be sort of our own TED Talks, um, which, uh, which I think is designed to address specifically that. Uh, should we as an industry do more together? Very probably. Thank you. Very interesting presentation. I wanted to ask, if you're so keen on dissemination of research results, and Netflix is seen as a good model for challenging um, pirate sites, why has no publisher sort of adopted the micropayment schemes like Netflix and iTunes and Spotify? Why is it still $35 or more for a single download? Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, another great question. Um, and when I talked about have we, have we really harnessed technology um, beyond saying we're 95% digital or what it is? We've been online since 1991. So I talked mainly about it in terms of workflow uh, and delivery uh, and distribution of content, so how we get things to market. I didn't get started on business models, but I could. You know, absolutely. I, mean, it, it, I, I doubt that there's a publisher who at this point isn't thinking about, A, how can we enable broader access? How can we grow our top line? You know, whichever way you want to, to think about it, by pricing at a way which is, uh, which is more uh, in keeping with the way that people actually want to consume content, which may be in, in smaller pieces than it is now. Do we have, and I speak to publishers, I hope they'll nod their heads, you know, do we have the systems and the investment in the, in the back end and the front end to enable that to happen? No, not really. Um, and certainly, again, I can only talk for Wiley that um, you know, we have uh, a lot of dollars at the moment, is all I'll say, pouring into to reshaping all of our back-end systems so that we can proliferate business models, we can, uh, we can offer different kinds of pricing, we can bundle, we can customize, and all of those things. And at the heart of it, yes, there's a philosophical question of what philosophical and commercial what we believe the ultimate value is of what piece of content, right? It used to be, it's the book. And the only reason I think for a while we got to a position where professional books and monographs were 250 pages plus is because that's the only way you could justify a price of $40 or $100 up. Actually, they could have been a tenth of the length and probably just as valuable. So uh, we have a way to go, um, but it's a, it's a great question. And I do think over the next um, three to five years, we'll have to see different business models evolve if we're going to keep attracting customers and users to, to our sites and the places where we deliver content and people are expecting to pay for it or use it in a different way. But no question. Any more? Uh, hello. Oh, that's very loud. <laughs> um, Isabel Thompson, Oxford University Press. Um, I mean, I agree completely with everything that you were saying. What I was wondering is, there seems to be kind of like a fundamental tension between everything that we might believe and want to happen um, and open science and then our archaic business models that are um, completely dependent on separate companies and competition. Um, do you think that there's a possibility that we can overcome that to work together to solve the problems we all need, think of what, that we all see are there, or do you think that we won't? Uh, <laughs> um, and if we don't, what do you think will happen? Um, I, it is the right question. Um, I would like to think that we can. Um, you know, I do believe in co opetition that in the better interests of all of our customers, consumers, users, there are ways to work together which can enable, um, that can enable better outcomes for people who are using what we, what we do. I mean, Crossref was certainly an example, uh, and I think I talked about Crossshare, which is at a very early stage, um, but clearly, you know, sharing both the two things that I talked about, so both uh, rethinking the approach to authentication so that signing effectively, you know, signing in once and having access across publisher platforms does require 
quite extensive amounts of collaboration, not only in the principle of doing it, but also the work that needs to be done in the plumbing to make sure that it happens. Um, so I'm hopeful about that, that we can make real progress. And I'm hopeful about ways that we might address uh, sharing in particular. As I said I talked about cross-share. That, that's an industry initiative. The SDM Association is providing exactly the right kind of leadership and context for that work to get done. Uh, but I think that it has to. You know, I think that it has to. I think that, that it, it's clear in some of the numbers that I put up and, and others that if we don't address issues like seamless access uh, pricing um, and how we, how, we offer, um, how we offer smaller, uh, more personalized experiences around content based on exactly what you need and are priced accordingly, if we don't do these things, then there will be alternatives, either big commercial alternatives, our own equivalent of Netflix, you know, or Uber that will disrupt us, um, or they'll be, or they'll be, um, they, if, even if they're in violation of copyright, they'll be, you know, they will be um, giving people what they want. So I'm hopeful. Um, I think that some of the pressures on the industry that I've talked about are driving publishers to collaborate. Um, obviously, I, you know, I think that competition. Uh, will continue to be an important driver of, of progress and innovation. And I don't think it takes us away from publishers competing with each other. But if we are going to collectively create better experiences than the ones we currently are, then we're better off doing that together. And I do have some hope that we can see a few things over the next year or so that will be real progress. Hi, my name is Kabe from River Valley Technologies. And forgive me if this is a little bit um, technical, but you mentioned, it's your fault, you mentioned PDF, HTML, etc. <laughs> um, so I fully agree with almost everything you said, and we must be PDF-centric. But we, firstly, we must be careful that we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. A beautiful PDF is still... We, we all like to look at it, beautiful typography, hyphenation, etc. all the things that make it a pleasure to read. And secondly, you mentioned going towards HTML. Just, I just want to mention it. I agree, as long as it is a very specific, very clean, and clearly defined HTML. Yeah. It's very tempting because browsers will show you anything. They're designed to, to, to not to fall over even if it's horrendous content. So we should look beyond the browser, because in 50 years' time, we don't know. There won't be a browser. There won't be a web. Who knows? Another two learners will, will come along. Yep. So I just wanted to throw that in. Thank you. Yeah. No, great. I, I, yes, nothing to disagree with there. You know, it's, uh, these are ideas that we're, you know, we're, all, we're all wrestling with. And yes, PDFs, when they, when they work well, you know, they are they are elegant and precise and protect. when they don't work well, when they don't render well, they're a complete nightmare. Um, as we know, nothing that we can that we can do about it. But it's sort of and the HTML question I think is partly related to the point about about open standards. Um, you know, we would need to collectively, um, I believe, work in an environment that, that creates really structured output that's going to reflect um, the needs of the of the article itself and the needs of the and the needs of the research, we're not quite at that point, you know, either. So all those things go together, right? It's the workflow, it's the open standards and the, the, the way that we use HTML, and it's the emergence of, you know, the current generation of web browsers is not going to look like anything like this in five years' time, and how do we stay close to that? So I agree, that is completely the limit of my technical knowledge and very slightly beyond it. Okay. Thank you very much.